So today's uh, webinar is going to look at um, the reason for selecting teams of bulls for bull selection for AI uh, and Donna's take on why or how you should go about selecting bulls for your herd. And then we're going to have Richie O'Brien, who's the uh, coordinator of the Chagas Glambia joint program with the last 10 or more years, uh, looking after um, the monitor farms across the Glambia territory. And he's going to discuss what he has done with the previous monitor farmers in terms of their selection of bulls, as and how that has worked for them, and what he's looking at in terms of selection criteria for his current group of monitor farmers across the territory. So, um, We'll just check now if we have Donna available yet. He needs a password, he said. So we might just uh, actually start there with Richie, so, so just while we get him in. Um, I need the password. Yeah. I'll just start with you there, Rich, so. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, basically, I'm just going to talk I'm just going to talk about the, uh, in the past I've been working with monitor farmers, as George said, for the last 10 years and their experience uh, of using sire advice and using teams of bulls. And I suppose the initial, you know, you have to, works. Uh, we've had loads of on-farm research and research in Moorpark and other areas that shows that it does work. And I just throw up this slide. I'm just, just one, I'm going to use one slide and I'm just throwing up this slide based to see why we use the sire advice, why we're putting so much emphasis on the whole area of bull selection and, and picking a good team of bulls. And this is the system that we have based here. This is the animal, this is a slide I got from Brendan Horn a number of years ago, and I put this up to farmers. I use a lot of farm walks and that. It's basically look at aligning grass growth to our breeding decisions. And basically, we're now in the middle of April, where we have cows, if I have a 90% of my cows calf in six weeks, so basically 50% calf maybe by the 15th of February. So those cows now are up to peak appetite when grass is growing at its peak. So rather than making more silage now and having a flatter curve, we've all heard about curves now, we want both to peak together. We want grass growth to peak together and we want cow appetites to peak together. And that's really why the whole time we talk about a 90%, uh, it might sound simple, 90% six-week calving rate, but that, that's the decisions. I put that slide up to kind of emphasize to myself the whole time, emphasize to, to farmers that, that that's why we're making the decision, and that's why we're putting a big emphasis on fertility uh, at this stage. So really, we want cows a peak appetite, peak yield, and getting all that yield from grass rather than import of feed, and that's the idea of that slide. Uh, in my experience over the years, it's really... And, and talking to farmers in the last couple of days is really just trust the figures. It gets the job done. When I use the sire advice, the job is done. Don't, during the breeding season then, I don't really need to be thinking about uh, the decisions about what bulls I pick and that. It's done. It goes to the handheld uh, for the AI team, and he has all that information then that he can utilize. And I suppose given the, the current situation with COVID, it works extremely well that there's less contact with the AI technician. He has all the uh, information on his handheld and, and he doesn't need. So I was talking to an AI technician the other day, a local one here in Kilkenny, and he says to me that 30% of, of his clients are using this. Now we'd hope that more, but from his perspective, he goes into the yard, he has the information and can get the job done without any contact. So it works from that point of view. We know there's gain I'm going to show that in a minute but I think the biggest thing and I'll say it at the end as well it gets the job done and, and you need to trust the figures from the point of view the science is there Donna will talk about the science of this later but the science is there and it does work now if I look at the the performance of monitor farms over the years like you know there's 20 monitor farms that are still in a group there from over the last number of years and they have a current EBI of 147 so if I compare that to the EBI of the Glambia average is 111. So they're way above the average. They, they have a, an EBI gain of 8 euros. And that's, that all sounds good on paper. What's actually happening in practice, though, I looked over the last number of years, they're getting an 80% six-week calving rate. So they're, they're getting that uh, calving rate right for the grass scenario. And they're also producing 500 and, producing 510 kilograms of milk solids and that's mainly coming from grass so it's, it's working for them in practice that they're getting the solid 
They're getting the days in milk and they're getting the days in grass. So if I look at the current criteria that, you know, the current group of farmers, the criteria that we're using for those farms really is, um, you know, to use a team of bulls. Now, those, the team of bulls is ranging from seven to 15 straws. And the biggest thing is, is that they're used evenly. If you look at any of the information coming back from ICBF, there seems to be a higher weighting towards a couple of bulls in the team. And that, that causes issues, uh, Dunlan will talk about later, where bulls go up and down slightly. So you use the bull team evenly, and that's one thing we would pick enough, pick a big enough team. Uh, if Brian Cody didn't pick 15 players every, every year, there'd be a problem. He picked the best players, and you let them off and, and don't have any, trying to avoid any weaknesses in the system. So uh, seven to 15 straws, on average, they're using 12 straws. So the team of bulls, so the biggest one, if I just use the high EBI, the simplest figure is the highest, highest EBI there. Bull teams are in 250 to 320 of an EBI and an average using 12 straws. I suppose the other thing within the, the uh, sire advice, which is very, very useful, is that they can mark out cows that they don't need, so cows for culling, and cows that you want to use a beef straw on. And that gets, you know, that job is done. I don't want to use uh, an AI Friesian straw on them. So that, you know, so from, from a sire fight, that's very useful to be able to take them out of the system. Um, uh, so the criteria used across the farms basically was 270 of an EBI, um, 120 for fertility sub-index, uh, 80 for milk sub-index, 25 kilos of fat and protein, and less than 200 kilograms of milk. Now, they were the five key criteria that we put in. Now, if you pick, as anyone that has run the sire advice, if you pick too many criteria, uh, we'll get no bulls. So they're the first kind of high EBI, good fertility, a good sub-index in, in, in fertility and milk, and trying to get the solids with less water, which will up the percentages. And then after that, within that, you might get 13, 14 bulls, or you might get 20 bulls. Pick out then the other criteria, as far as health, uh, maintenance, so plus in health, maintenance of around 10 to 15. Um, so that's basically what, what's happening on the farms and what has been happening on the farms, George, in the last, uh, in the last while. Uh, that. Okay, thanks, Rich. So, um, so I suppose basically it's just, as you said, trusting in the figures is the key thing. Um, I think we actually have done it there, so we might... Are you, are you, are you okay now, Donna? Can you hear me? Yeah, try. Do you want to go ahead? Do you want to try? Okay, so yeah, so you're going to run the slides. I'll sure, run the yeah. slides there for you. Just give me one second now to switch. Yeah. Okay. So okay. what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes is just about bull selection. So Stuart, if you just move on to the next 10 minutes. And bull it's team selection. <laughs> it's a bit of delay. Team really and risk, one measure of risk is reliability. So firstly, I want to just start off with what is reliability. And if you look on a bull catalog on the ICBF website, bull search yep. or website. on the active bull list, you'll yes, have sir. an EBI of an animal with a reliability figure associated with it. Uh, and, that, and, of an and that's the same irrespective of whether it's the sub-indexes or the component traits individually. So what reliability means is how confident are the ICBF that the published value reflects the true value of the animal. So for example, you never know really the true EBI of an animal or the true milk production potential of an animal until at several years of age, until it's 99% reliable. So you have a prediction of what it is at a younger age, and then you have the reliability figure associated with it. Now, a low reliability figure does not say, oh, this animal is going to move. It just tells you the likelihood of the extent of the boom. Liability varies from zero to nine percent, but in reality, it's not really that is zero percent. For a reliability, or for the just on to the next slide, George, EDI confidence level across the top. So this is just showing you uh, with reliability across the bottom. Um, and what I'm just calling the confidence interval in euros across the top. 
So if we just go on to, Stuart, hit the, the, the button so you get a, dot, a red dotted line. At 30% reliability, what this means is that a bull can move by around plus or minus 150 euros as it accumulates more information. So if you go onto the active bull list or whatever, and you have a bull there are 300 euros in EBI with 30% reliability over time. So in the next few years, that bull could vary from 450 euros down to 150 euros in EBI. If you hit on the next animation, Stuart, some, a green line should come on at 10%, another line at 90%. So people might think at 90% reliable, bull is solid and not going to move while this graph is clearly showing you that is the bull can move plus or minus 50 euros still even at 90 percent reliability so this notion that genomic bulls move a lot and high reliability bulls don't move is not necessarily true and this is the same irrespective of species so beef sheep cattle ducks it does make a difference and irrespective of country although the extent of the variability does differ but even with high reliability there can still, still be some movement so just moving on to the slide of the basis, basics of, of bull teams, as, I get, as what I said, is really, for me, it's about minimizing the risk. And nobody to date, I don't think, has ever phoned me to tell me that the bull has gone up. They always just phone me to tell me that the bull has gone down. And really what you don't want to happen is when you have a bull team that all the bulls go down. So I'm just giving you an, an illustration here. It's just like flipping a coin or whatever. If you have two bulls, right, the bull can either go up or go down. So if you choose two bulls, in red there you see two U's, so the bull, two bulls went up. The one beside the bull went up or a bull went down. The next one a bull went down or a bull went up. And in the blue you have the two bulls went down. So there's four different animations and there's a 25% chance that the two bulls will go down. And that's what you don't want. So you pick a bull team and the two of them go down. So essentially you're unlucky 25% of the with two bulls. Now if you had a three bull team, the chances of, of the three bulls going down has halved. And I've just given you the maths. Besides, you can do whatever you want. You can do two to the power of three, two to the power of four, two to the power of five if you have five bulls in your team. But if you look at the four bull team example, you only have a 6% chance that all the bulls will drop. Right? Of course, also you have a 6% chance that all the bulls will go as well. Now, the, the, the weird thing or the unique thing in a way, I guess, about high EBI bulls is they already are at the top of their game. So it's very hard for a, a, an extremely high EB, EBI bull to go up a lot. And there's probably a greater chance that they will come down because they're already ahead of the posse. And this is a key point is that, yes, if, you, if one of your bulls, your genomic bulls does, on average, they still maintain to be higher. So if we look at some of the data, and ICBF have put this data out for the past few years of heifers that are calving for the first time in, say, the year 2020, what were they bulled with uh, several years previous, or sorry, one year previous, um, or what were they out of several years previous, we can quite clearly see that the genomic bulls are still being on average 30 euros higher than the daughter pooping uh, bulls. Okay. All of this assumes that they're independent of each other. And if you might remember, the historical recommendation was a bull team of at least four, but that was based on the assumption that the four bulls were unrelated and they were used equally across the herd. So if you just move on to the next slide, um, Stuart, on bull teams. So that's what I said about the, the, the previous recommendation. Um, but let's just say, for example, you had a five bull team and you said, right, I've, I've taken Chagas's guidelines, but I've actually got a step ahead of that. I've checked a five bull team. But if you put 90% of the cows in calf just to one of the, of the bulls, that's really just a team of one bull. That's not a five team bull, a five, uh, a five bull team. It's a, it's a team of just one bull. Similarly, if you have a bull team with five animals inside it, but they're all paternal half sips, so they all come from the one bull. And if that bull himself is genomic, and if he drops, on average, all the bull, daughter, or bull, bull sons will also drop. Okay, so again, it's not about, okay, we must use at least seven bulls, but I'm gonna pick seven bulls, but if they're all from the one sire, that's really not seven different bulls. Okay. Now, the nice thing about it is that the ICBS fire advice actually does all these calculations for you. So you don't have to go to the maths about, oh, if I have these five different bulls, two of them are half sibs and uh, two of them are, are, are going to use them differently. What's the reliability going to be? You can put all this into the ICBS fire advice and it will actually generate the bull team reliability. And of course, it does other things. It mates with the cows to minimize the variability in the milk and the fertility amongst the progeny and also does the important inbreeding checks. So this is just a kind of a ready reckoner, um, team size by herd, team size by herd size, um, short. 
Um, again, look, it, it's available. Anybody can email me afterwards. It's, get it. But if you find where your herd size is, uh, what we're saying is this is the minimum number of bulls. So really what our recommendation previously was, was four. That's now seven. A seven bull team is the minimum really we should be talking about. And if you're up on around 200 to 250 cows, that's halfway down the table, we're talking about 11 bulls is the minimum bull size that you should be using. So that was the first half of my talk. I think I just have one slide. This is really probably my, my last slide apart from the, the concluding slide. And this is really about picking bulls. And it's really, I, I guess, uh, done a very fake on picking bulls. There's numerous ways to, uh, of picking bulls, but this is my strategy. Firstly, and, and uh, I hope no question will come in about it, is people will ask, well, what's a good bull? Well, you can't decide that until you decide is what is your herd stats at the moment. And I'm just showing you an example here of a, uh, a, 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 a summary, EBI summary report for a particular herd. So if we look at, say, the first lactation animal, 187 euros EBI, the second lactation animal, 175. So we're seeing good genetic trends here, that the younger animals are better than the, the, the older animals. Next thing you have to do is you have to identify where your key weaknesses. And ICBF have come up with a lovely little kind of a scorecard where it's identifying using a star system where your, your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. So if you identify that, okay, look, I'm happy with my milk solids, um, but I want to improve my fertility, then you need to pick a team of bulls who are similar on, on average milk solids as, as your herd, but have a better fertility sub-index than your herd. Right? So it's not a case that, oh, I must choose bulls that are minus five on calving. Right? You can't determine that until you actually look at your herd plus report and see, well, what is your herd calving interval? Now let's pick a team of bulls who are better than that. Okay. So once you've decided what you want to improve, uh, and another question that often comes up to me, I guess, a lot is, is about cow size and well, what's, a, what's a good maintenance up index I, I should go for my herd. Again, I can come out with, with rule of thumb figures, but to me, the easiest way to do it is to find something in your herd. I'd love to have a herd of that size of cow, okay? And then find out what the maintenance up index is. And then that's the maintenance of index that you want to target. And you can do the same for milk solids. If you want to know, well, what's a good milk solids for my herd? Find a group of around 10 or 15 or 20 cows that you think, yeah, that's, that's where I want to be from a milk solids perspective. Find out what the milk sub index is, and that's your target milk sub index for your herd. So pick a team of bulls that will help you to achieve that. But it comes then to actually picking bulls now that you've decided what your goal is. Picking bulls, to me, off the active bull list, and essentially, you know, some people might, might come back to me and, and dispute this, is I would say, forget about EBI. All these bulls on the, on the top of the active bull list, they are high EBI. Yes, as you go down the list, you will reduce an EBI, but they're essentially all high EBI. Like, it's not the case that, and again, it's the same when, when we debate about crossbreeding, is, is crossbreeding good or crossbreeding bad? It completely depends on the system. If we were so homogeneous, our active bull list would have around five bulls on it. And we'd be saying, right, everybody must use this five. It's not that case. So there is a, a menu to select from, the top 75 or 100 bulls, all high EBI, then you choose from that. From my perspective, rather than choosing seven bulls from the top 75 list, I would tend to firstly discard bulls don't want. And it just makes it a little bit easier then, rather than selecting seven from 75, you're possibly selecting seven from maybe 20 or 25. So if we just move on to the, the last my computer is just rebooting, so um, I don't have the last slide. But um, I, I think what I was saying on it was um, bull teams are crucially important for um, maintaining uh, the high reliability and minimizing the risk. And again, it's not a case of your child's advisor said use seven, so I'm going to use seven, but I'm really going to use one uh, on most of the herd. Just you have to be used uniformly across the herd. Um, ICBF's the, the SIR advice, it does some hard work. Again, like the EBI, the SIR advice is a tool. It's not the be all and end all. And again, if you have the time, one of the things I like to say is, well, pick your bulls, put them into SIR advice, get the answers, but do it yourself as well on the side and then mix and match and see, okay, how did SIR advice do this meeting while I did this meeting? And sometimes SIR advice will be right and sometimes SIR advice will be wrong. But you've essentially done, done it twice to get to the, to the real answer. And the second half of the talk was really about SAR selection, um, and again, it comes back to what is your breeding goal? 
you need to have your heart plus report to see the breathing goal then that's your, where your status is. Now, what do I want to do to achieve that? Or where do I want to go? And then what are the goals I need to achieve that? So I think that's it, Stuart. Hopefully you could, you could hear me. Yeah, we got you pretty good there and for most of it anyway. Just, um, I suppose you might just go back over the, 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 just the piece that you were saying about the maintenance index you just dropped out there. Okay. Uh, just, that, just on picking the number of cows that you, I know what you're saying from discussing it with you prior, but we just lost you just yep. at that point. Okay, so a question I often get asked is about uh, what maintenance sub-index do I need for a 550 kilo cow or what maintenance sub-index do I need for a, a given cow? And I, and I can come out with the values and we can talk about them later if you want, uh, what they are on average. But for me, the easiest thing is to go on into your herd, find 10 to 15 to 20 cows that you just like the size of them. Right? If, if this is, I'm not saying that this is what you should be doing, but if, if your preference is on for a maintenance perspective, Find out how the size of them. Go into the ICBF. Find out what their average maintenance is, and that's the maintenance of the next you need to achieve that type of a cow size. So then you put your bulls to get you to that. So if your maintenance of index is above that, right? If your cows are, are smaller, then you might want to use bulls who have a, a maintenance of index which is less than your herd, and they will bring them down to where you want to be. And I'm not sure if you got it, the same thing applies for all the trees. Milk solids is the People say, well, what milk solids do I, do I need? And I don't want yeah. them too high and I don't want them too low. Well, find the bull, find the cows that you like milk solids you love. Get their milk solid sub-index from the ICBF. That's where you, that's your target. That's, that's your where you want to get your herd top. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so just um, because of the technical difficulties at the start, I failed to remind people there that there's a Q and A uh, option on the on the Zoom program that you can use to send in some questions. Uh, so I'm just going to start with one question here from Lisa Ring for you, Donna. Um, any comment on team size for heifers, which is probably one of the contributing factors with the last number of years to this over reliance on um, individual bulls, or the like Richie would have said earlier that there's a there tends to be more of uh, a particular bull is sire to a lot of the daughters that we have on the ground, possibly because of overuse in heifers. So just to comment on the team size for the heifers, please. Yeah, so so firstly, um, you would be slow, Lisa, to use low reliability bulls on heifers, especially on smaller heifers. And look, I, I, I hate putting rules on it, but I know people like, like to get actual numbers. What, we, what we'd really be talking about is, is uh, probably a minimum reliability of 70 to 80%, especially for the smaller heifers' reliability, right? Once you use high reliability bulls, then you can kind of relax the, the team size a little bit. Now, ICBF have, have done a lovely little um, uh, addition this year about the risk for, for individual or risk for, for use on heifers. So if I look at the, 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 t the bulls available, that are high reliability uh, and the target is 80% and are less than, say, 5% for calving difficulty. Look, there's around 15, 15 bulls, I think, available on that list. Uh, they come from a whole range of different star lines. So there is, there is no reason why you can't have a decent sized bull team. Um, but of course, you know, there's, there's complexities and there's not a massive amount of heifers. So obviously, if you only have you know, 10 heifers, it's going to be difficult to probably use seven different bulls uh, on those heifers. But uh, the key point is bull teams is to overcome low reliability, but just be slow on using low reliability bulls for heifers, especially small heifers. Hopefully that answered us. Yeah, so um, I might just uh, bring you in there, Richie, just to um, ask you to comment on what Donna said there possibly in relation to EBI, I'd be of the opinion, I, I agree with you, Donna, um, maybe the audience may not agree with you, I've, I've very rarely advised in picking on EBI, as you said, pick the right traits and you should generally be picking the EBI, so that's, I presume that's what you've been doing with the, um, I'm giving you the answer already, Richie, I suppose, but feel free to. Yeah, no. <laughs> so calving difficulty, as Donna, like the size of the heifer so calving difficulty becomes the big the big issue when you're choosing uh bulls for the for for heifer so that's that's the big one there and i think the big one we i i'm using the criteria 80 percent so the reliability of the figures 
should be 80% for calving difficulty. And I think the calving difficulty figure should be around 5%. I know the figures have changed or uh, we have more information on the heifers, the divided heifers and cows. So it's 5%, it used to be 2%. Now it's 5% if you do that calculation for the heifers. So, and make sure there's enough daughters on the ground and there's enough daughter. If, if that figure comes up as 80%, then there's enough daughters on the ground to show that that figure is accurate and we can use, use those bulls. The other side of that is there is, uh, on, on our website, we have uh, uh, teams of bulls that are out there for heifers, um, for smaller heifers and for bigger heifers. And I just looked at the monitor farms, what they have used. They have used actually four, uh, when I went back on it the other day, there's actually four bull average used across the heifers with, with high reliability. And their EBI is around 250. So... They've dropped a bit in the EBI slightly to get the calving difficult, but still high enough. I, I think what Donald said there is a fair point. You know, if you look at the top bulls, be it from 250, 230 to 300 EBI, there's enough bulls out there to, to, and they're still high enough EBI to be able to make decisions with. So I think the biggest one of the heifers is 80, that the figures are reliable, that the calving difficulty figures are reliable. They're 80% reliable and at 5% difficulty. Very good. <clears throat> and then I suppose just on the, again, coming back to the selection criteria that Donna has said there and how it's very important that people are selecting for their own herds. Have you, um, we'll say, is there much of an overlap amongst the, is, I think it's 11 monitor farmers that you have in your program at the moment. Um, is there much of an overlap in the bulls that they're using this year? Yeah, there's there's probably there's probably three or four bulls that there's an overlap in all the sire advice and I went, went looking at it. But there's and as Donald said, there's certain people that have other criteria as about size of cows. Uh, I remember talking to one the, the guy in, in one of the marshall farms in Wexford and size of cow was a big thing with him. And he was looking for a higher maintenance figure than that. So he wanted a smaller type cow and he reckoned that some of the bulls were big. And that's a criteria. And that's fair enough. That's a criteria that he set out for his herd that he wanted. And, 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 that, that's, and that's fair enough. In a lot of the herds, there was a lot of fertility. I look at the, the, the EBI reports. There's an awful amount of fertility in most of the farms. There's an awful amount of fertility in, in the fertility sub-index so what they were looking for is bringing the fertility and the solids with it so that's why we brought the 25 kilograms of fat and protein and most lads all the bulls all the all the um sire advice that i look they all have fat and protein over 25 kilos and less than 200 it's one of the things that we said we can bring the fertility and you can bring the fat and protein solids together without too much water very good <clears throat> Um, so just the questions are beginning to start here now in the Q&A, thankfully. Uh, so Donald Kelly is asking, is there any comment in terms of target fertility sub-index for the Holstein versus the Jerseys? I suppose we'll throw that one to you, Donna. So, so from my perspective, and a good example is the uh, next-gen herd. Um, I believe its fertility sub-index is around 100. And we've kind of been consistent enough in that uh, this, uh, with all the different analysis that we've done. So for a black and white herd, what you'd really want to be hitting at is around 100 euros uh, fertility sub-index. Now, just remember, like there, there is a notion there that um, these bulls are, are really, some of the bulls are really high in fertility sub-index, but also the herds are really low, or some herds are really low in fertility sub-index. So you have to take the average of the bulls and the herd to get to where you're going to be. And don't forget, it's only a 20% replacement rate. So for example, if your fertility sub-index of your herd was 50, you might say, okay, I'll use the bull who's 150, and sure, then I'll be at 100. Not true, because you only have a proportion of your heifers coming in, and it'll take you, you know, seven, eight, nine years to actually um, in, uh, in get your herd up to 100 euros fertility sub-index. Another good rule of thumb, based on your average herd, right? If you want to set yourself a target of increasing EBI, your fertility sub-index, your milk sub-index, whatever, you set yourself a target, which is a good enough target, of five euros improvement per year. You have to be using a team of bulls who are 70 euros higher than your herd. So again, let's just play that one out. If you have a herd who's got, um, say, a fertility sub-index of, or let, let, yeah, fertility sub-index of 50, you, want, you say, I'm going to improve it by five euros per year, then you need to use a team of bulls who are 120 euros this year, 120 uh, fertility sub-index, 125 euros fertility sub-index next year, et cetera. Now, if you want to go up at 10 euros per year, so if you want to go from 50 to 100 fertility sub-index in five years, 
you need to be using a team of bulls who are 140 on fertility sub-index. So there I'm saying now 190 fertility sub-index, next year 200 euros fertility sub-index, next year 210 fertility euros uh, fertility sub-index values. Okay, very good. So we just have a seeking a clarification from both of you, and I think uh, I think it's correct anyway. Uh, just double checking that the calving difficulty is less than or at five percent. Correct. Yeah. So the the transformation, if you would have really gone for two two to two point four percent, that's what kind of kind of what we were recommending last year, right? Was the bulls who are less than two percent or less than around two point four percent suitable for heifers? Right. As I said, ITBF are doing a lot of the work for you at the moment, but I know some guys like myself like to see the figures. Richie's spot on, 80% reliability, and that's now less than 5%. Okay, because what has happened is the calving difficulty genetic evaluations previously, we just kind of lashed everything in together, the bulls or the cows, the heifers, the beef and the dairy. What has happened is that now has been separated into four groups. So we have a calving difficulty proof for dairy heifers, a calving difficulty proof for dairy cows. Okay, they want to be looking at the dairy heifer calving difficulty and less than 5%. If, and that's for small heifers. If they're good, well grown heifers, you know, yourselves, you can probably go a little bit higher if you want. Yeah, um, so I suppose just if people are interested in it, I, I, I'm of the belief that Siobhan Ring has done um, a podcast with Emma Louise Coffee there on that topic this week, so it should be available if it's not already available, if people want to tune into that as well. So just. Um, just on that as well, I suppose I would say that uh, just to give people a guideline, um, if you take Black Lightning that Eurogene had, SEW from Dove and HMY, Hymon Kenny from Munster uh, and Progressive with the last number of years, their equivalent calving difficulty now under the new figures are, is just around 4%. So they would be bulls that would have been renowned for very easy calving. Uh, so just as a guideline for people to kind of gauge it from, that the, that four percent figure is kind of the the real super easy caver, uh, and Donna has said there are five percent, and that's for that's for heifers. Obviously, you can go slightly higher if you want. And the cow, well, in terms of the the figures haven't changed much from the cow point of view. So if a cow was maybe one point eight last year, there's a possibility she might be up around two on the new index this year. So hasn't been much of a movement in terms of calving difficulty around the cows. Uh, the big change has been in the heifers, and as as the lads have said there to use those targets and use the lists. And I would say as well that it's always important to talk to the AI companies that you're dealing with. Um, they're never going to give out a bull that's going to give you trouble at calving with heifers for definite because they don't want to phone ring in next February complaining about that problem. So, um, uh, so right, so just, a, a, just on that one, Stuart, just, just again, just to, to clarify, there is a column there now in the ICBF system that just, to, again, if you're just wondering, Jesus, was it five, was it six, what are you saying? It's a column insider about the risk. It says risk of dairy heifer calving difficulty. And just make sure that that's low. Yeah. Right? Yes, uh, very good. And it goes from low or moderate. And if there's no information behind the bull, they're automatically given a, a high uh, standard for, for yeah. calving. And so make sure, and make sure it's reliable. Yes, yeah. So yeah. daughters on the ground. So young, on the ground. Un, young, unproven bulls as such um, with just genomic data com, coming to the top of the list sometimes aren't, aren't going to be suitable for heifers so so now we're getting one there's a contentious one after coming in here now uh, from christopher mccarthy with the greens being all about now and co2 would you, would you choose bulls with higher milk kgs with the idea of less cows more milk and will will with the ebi over the coming years will it be more milk kgs will will milk kgs be higher ebi so will it change will the focus of the ebi stance change to reflect kind of that kind of po potential policy change so, so we changed back in around 2007, um, I think, is when we actually changed it from quota being the limiting factor to land being the limiting factor, which, uh, which even under a kind of a, a uh, let's say, a green strategy would probably still be the same. And there is, there is a good bit of confusion or misinterpretation, I think, about the production within the EBI. We say it's around 34%. In reality, I think it's probably closer to around 60 to 70% because there are three ways to increase your milk production per cow. And this is crucial because at the end of the day, okay, the question came in about milk production per cow. It's, it's going well down to at the end of the day it's about profit. And there's more to life or more to profit than milk, right? It's about the cost as well. But there's three ways to increase your milk production per cow. Note the way I said milk production per cow, not milk production per lactation. 
which most people talk about. They talk about their three or five days. I think we need to move away from that. We need to move to longer lactations and uh, more lactations, right? So three ways. First way, way, Christopher said it spot on, increasing your uh, fat and protein caging. Grant, everybody will accept that. Those that have higher fat and protein cage, on average, produce uh, daughters that have higher fat and protein cages per lactation, right? And it's all standardized to a three or five days. Our median lactation length in milk recorded herds is around 288 days. We're losing yield by not having a longer lactation. The only way we can have a longer lactation is to get our cows to calve earlier if we want to die, depending on where you are in, in the country. To get that, you need to have a good fertility sub-index. Right? You can't get cows calving in February and March unless you have a good fertility sub-index. So the emphasis that you see on fertility, a lot of that is actually also onto milk. The easier one, the better one, I would argue, is the survivability. So we know that a mature cow yields 22% more than the first lactation cow. So if we have bad survival, if we take our, our foot off the gas when it comes to fertility and put it onto milk, we will start going backwards on survival. Our herds will get younger and we'll actually end up producing less milk, right? So we need to be getting to five and a half lactations per cow. So if you think about the, the, most people will talk about a culling rate of around 18%, right? You divide one by 0.18 and you'll get around five points. So the, the homework, I, if I was allowed to give out homework, given the current situation, uh, Stuart, would be look at the cows you've culled over the past few years, past two or three years, depending on your herd size. What, how, how, how many lactations did they have each? What you'd see on average is that it's only around three and a half you're actually losing around two lactations of yield, right? So for some people, that would be a ton of milk solids, right, because they're mature cows. Now, that's when it comes about milk solids. But when we talk about, the question was about the greens, what you have at home is you have a heifer doing nothing for you, other than producing meat in and, and uh, urinating out for two years, and you're diluting all of that, let's call it environmental hoof print, over three and a half lactations. While in reality, what we want with the EBI is you dilute that environmental hoop over five and a half lactations. So no is the question, is, it, is really the answer to the question is, I don't see us changing much of the emphasis away from fertility to milk because there already is a huge amount of emphasis on lifetime milk performance. Yeah, and that's basically, Stuart, back to the figures I gave earlier on the past monitor farmers where they drove the fertility, they're getting the 80% uh, six-week calving rate. The ch herds now have come probably more to a static. Most of those herds are kind of at their limits as regards expansion, so the herds are maturing. And like their solid sold last year or produced last year was 510 kilograms of milk solid. So take a little bit off that for calves and that. So slightly below 500 kilograms sold. And if I compare that to the Glombia average uh, is 416. So the, the, the fertility, uh, the, the kilograms of milk subindex is, is getting uh, the solids in those herds and the maturity is getting the solids in the herd. So yes, the, what exactly what Donna said is working in practice on those farms that they're getting more solids per cow. It's not more water; they're getting more solids of fat and protein. Yeah, I suppose it's always worth pointing out as well that the the base cows, the capacity in terms of milk kilos already to produce six and a half to seven thousand liters, and there aren't huge numbers of people achieving that kind of average yield for a lot of the reasons that Donna's already pointed out in relation to lack of survival in the herd, etc. Um, and from that point of view, there's more than enough milk in there already. You now, people do have cows producing lots of milk, but uh, it's milk solids is what we're getting paid for, and that's what we should be fo continue to focus on. And there are plenty of negative um, milk kg herds that I've come across in the past that are doing 560, 570 kilos of milk solids quite comfortably, so highly profitable herds. Uh, so the focus doesn't necessarily have to be on, or shouldn't, won't be turning towards kilos of milk. So there's uh, on the same kind of a vein, then um, Andrew Janine is just asking, is there, are, are the AI companies possibly breeding bulls that are too high in PD for milk and not concentrating enough on percentages to bring the kgs of solids rather than the volume, uh, considering that we are being penalized for volume? So that's, I suppose, reinforcing the answers that we've all just given. But uh, any comments in terms of the bulls that are on the, on the list at the moment in terms of their kilos of milk, lads? 
Richie, I suppose, maybe more so because don't know you don't probably look at the list um, from the yeah, point so, where you're picking really much. So when I'm picking, when I'm picking, like you're going to get the kilograms of fat and protein uh, with with lower. So when I, I'm looking at less than 200 kilograms of milk in the in the bull team, and I'll get 25 to 30 kilograms of fat and protein in that bull team, and I'll get the percentages then also. So if I look down, I can get bulls way over 200 kilograms of milk. I can get 40 or maybe 35 kilograms of fat and protein, but very low percentages. So there's no need to be bringing all, that's an inefficient cow. There's no need to be bringing all that water into the system. Keep the 200 kilo, keep it below 200 kilograms of milk um, and, and make sure that the percentages are up, which gives you then your kilograms of fat and protein. And that's really what, it, what it's about, getting the kilograms. If we just leave out that figure of kilograms of milk, it's, it's the kilograms of fat and protein combined. That's the figure. Now, when I went back on, on, on the farm, like as I said to you, like all of those had an average 30 kilograms of fat and protein, the, the, bull, the team of bulls. So that's, that's what's compared to what's in the cows themselves. Very good. Donna, do you want to make a comment on it? No, no, no more. He's at all. Okay. Um, yeah, so I suppose the one thing I would say is there's probably scope for, in some cases, there's probably is scope for some of the higher milk bulls, but that are still hitting Richie's criteria there. So the, the plus 200s maybe, there can be a little bit of scope for some of them to be used within the herd, within the team of bulls. And that's where the priority has to be emphasized, or the, what has to be emphasized is it's the team of bulls. So you could have a bull that's at minus 100 and you can have a bull that's at plus 100. And uh, the Sire Advice Program will help allocate those within reason to the, the correct cow in the herd so that you're not adding milk on top of milk, uh, ideally. And we'll say obviously not reducing milk volume either. Um, but the focus is on the kilos of salads. Um, I suppose the, the inner around zero for milk is probably uh, are, are a, little bit with, a little positive isn't a bad way to be but we don't need to be focusing too much on it so um then but, again, but again on that on that one there Stuart I know I said it no comment but again on that it goes back to the herd plus so I remember in the olden days I used to get awful grief that you know oh geez I need bulls that are plus 250 to drive my milk and I did an analysis that was shown that her um, geez could actually have increased so we have to we're just lo we're losing we're losing you there now again. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I'm not sure where you lost me, but you have to look at the herd report. What is your your milk kgs? In reality, as you said, it should be your what is your fat and protein kgs, and then you need to pick a team of bulls that are better than that if you want to improve it. Okay, and just the analysis that? the analysis that you did will say on the. Oh, yeah, but like I was just I was just sick of people telling me, do you know, I'm I'm seven thousand eight thousand liters. I need bulls that are plus four hundred percent. There's none available. And when you look at their data, they only need the bulls that are plus fifty, and they would have yeah. increased their their milk. These are liquid milk guys, so they would have increased their yield, right? Yeah. So you can't go out there with these black recommendations. Oh, too much milk in those, or oh, not enough milk in that bull. It all depends on your system. You feed you up the feeding level by a ton of concentrates, you're going to get a very different yield, even though you've genetically exactly the same cow. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's true. It's a, it's good to point out that the it, we're only the genetics are creating the capacity and management can either under or over deliver on that capacity too. So, um, so just, uh, David Finley is asking then, I suppose this one maybe pointed towards you initially Donna, I suppose. And, uh, then maybe Richie, maybe if you have any comment from the monitor program, any advice on using cows on work and now with selecting cows that you might not want to breed replacements from. Oh yeah, perfect, perfect time, David, to be to be doing it. So, so we we'll just we we'll just take a step back, David. You're obviously included with things, but people might be up to date with the cow index. So, this is something that developed by ICBF, um, that Bags Kelleher down there. That what we're looking at there is it identifies the cows that are suitable for culling, right? So the EBI is to identify cows that are suitable for breeding, and the cow identifies the animals that are suitable for culling. And what it encapsulates is it encapsulates the expected lifetime for remaining lifetime performance of an animal. It also includes the crossbreeding effect, the heterosis effect. That's not included in the EBI. But we know on average, if you have a crossbred, let's just say a crossbred jersey and a host and creation of the same EBI, first lactation, both of them are first lactation, on average, we expect the crossbred to live a little bit longer because of this heterosis or this crossbreeding effect. That's inside in the cow index. 
but it's not in the EBI because she doesn't transmit it. Also, what's included inside it is the expected calving debt. So you could have a super duper EBI cow, right? But you just missed her bulling. And she's not going to calve next year. I know this is the wrong time to be saying it now, but she's not going to calve next year until May. Like, chances are she's not going to be profitable. She should be culled, even though she has a high EBI. So you should use the cow index, and, and David, you're spot on. Now is when you should be looking at the cow index. Go on, every one of you, go on to the ITBF, look at the cow index. It'll rank your cows, right? The ones at the bottom, and again, it's the same as what I said about sire advice and EBI. This is a tool. It's not the be-all and end-all. You know yourself from the cows that you'd like to call. Identify those cows this year, or, or probably now that you're probably not going to see through to next year, right? Are you going to use BC and whatever? Then you run the cow index, see them match up. And they won't match up 100%, but then challenge yourself as to, well, why didn't I pick that low cow, cow um, animal, uh, my uh, calling criteria? And what you might see is she has got mastitis for the past few years, or in three serves to go in calf every year, and then you add her to your culling list. The next time to do it is at the end of the breeding season, ideally after your pregnancy diagnosis. Because if you put the pregnancy diagnosis into the database, what that does, it says that this cow is not in calf, and immediately she goes up to the bottom of the cow in the list. In other words, she's a strong candidate to cull because she's not in calf. Or it'll say she's not going to calf until May next year. So she's a strong candidate to cull. So yeah, David, spot on. Now this to be using the cow in the list. Hello? You're gone, okay. Stuart. I just had two people trying to break into me there at the moment, at, for, so I had to go on mute there for a second. So, um, just have you any comment, Richie, I suppose, in terms of um, what using cow with the monitor farmers? Yeah, and I listen, and, and again, yeah, I'm green with, but I suppose from a practical point of view, I think sometimes we can overcomplicate. I think the first one I'm looking at is the bulls. I think at ground level, if we can get the team of bulls right, I think the cows themselves automatically call themselves. And I said they're at the bottom of the list anyway. As Donna said, if you look at the list, the high cell count cows, the slow milkers, the ones that are lake carvers, they're the ones that the lads are not going to use. They're not going to put... Uh, uh, AI straws onto uh, free breather replacements off of, so they are kind of they're automatically picked anyway at the start at the start of the breeding season. The cow, obviously, the 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 cow work is is something that is a tool that can be used, but uh, the cows. I think a lot of those cows now are identified uh, at the start of the breeding season automatically. Okay, so again, this one is kind of feeding off the, the last question as well. So this is the last question here, and then I have one, one more to put to you. Um, to get the best fertile cows out of your own herd, should you breed replacements out of the first three weeks of breeding only? So uh, to, I, I can't fully remember the question, the actual wording of the question that you said, short, but that is very good practice, um, unless you have shockers in there, because it's not about having uh, genetically good fertility it's also about having them the heifers born good and early so you can grow them up right mature size because you, you can like genetically you can have a lovely heifer uh, from a fertility perspective but if she's at the wrong size of calving she's going to be really hard to get in calf so yes i i i think apart from the few odd howlers and again this is where the cow index could be really really useful you should really i believe be back to feed your heifers from the first uh, cows that come in calf. And as kind of like what Richie said, inherently the high fertility cows will come bulling early on in the breeding season, assuming that you have a strict calving day as well, strict calving season. Yeah, yeah so and, I, I, and in I, practice, Stuart, I see on the ground that, far, that, that the herds that are producing those big solids, we talk about 550 kilograms of solids, they, over the years, now this is uh, over time, the selection, once I keep uh, uh, breeding my heifers off the first three weeks and I do that w over time it's an automatic selection that my heifers over time will always be better They'll all, and, and, that's, and that has uh, been proven on the ground when you look at herds that have produced uh, a lot of solids on the ground the heifers are up to big weights uh, they're up to the right weights and as heifers then they produce good solids as heifers and when they get to second cap then they're able to last into the system. So the survivability of those heifers long term then is good because they're big enough at the first day at, at, at breeding uh, and as, as first calvers then they're good and strong, they produce and they last longer in the system. So that first three weeks thing I think it's essential and on the ground that has worked very well for people that have just used heifers 
um, just bred their heifers in the first three weeks, yeah. Okay, so uh, there's actually, this one is probably a little bit tricky to answer live here now, so we might have to get back to this person, but uh, we don't know the name because it's Galaxy A50 is after coming up as the as the login name. So uh, for British regions with 1,100 gallons, want more milk, how much more kgs of milk would you want to increase to 1,300 gallons without reducing the fertility? Now there's one for the body. Well, that, that's an easy one to, to answer because you can't answer it. Uh, that's the point to make. It's impossible to answer unless you. Um, I see the Heart Plus report. So, Galaxy, whatever, 480, send me an email with a Heart Plus report and we can work it out. But it's impossible. I, I don't know. You're feeding a ton of concentrate, you no concentrate, are you a good grass manager, are you a bad grass manager? I don't know that at all. So, I can't, can't come up with a recommendation. I can come up with a, with a recommendation, but it'll be for the average farmer. Very good. So, there's one loaded so, question here now, Donna, for you. Uh, from from a George Ramsbottom, is genomics working? Yes, the the evidence is quite clear that on average, genomics is working. Uh, the the herds that are using genomic technologies um, are uh, performing higher. When you look at co-op reports, are more profitable than those that are not. Uh, yes, those who move around. Uh, that's I think it was my second or my third slide. Um, and we always hear in media or we hear WhatsApp or AgriLand of the and because those bulls are usually the best bulls, they probably had a few sons as well. So logically, all their sons drop, and it's been mitigated as a complete utter disaster. Out of whatever 50, 100 bulls, bull drops, and the whole thing is put to the shambles. There's a technical advisory group, uh, including international experts, where we meet probably around three to four times per year, where we look at the system. We don't look at individual bulls because some bulls drop, some bulls go up. We look at the system and the system has been shown to work and be accurate. Now, again, there might be a few questions about some bull that dropped and why did he drop? Can answer it. We can go in and there's always an explanation as to why these individual bulls dropped. And also there's a similar explanation as to why some of these bulls went up. Very good. But it comes back to what I said about, uh, maybe it was missed. But there's some keywords inside there that on average these things work. And that was the whole reason I guess you asked me to give the talk was both teams are about averages. I know farmers they hear about that, but remember also the high reliability bulls can even at ninety percent reliability, the bulls can drop fifty euros and go up fifty euros. Right? Yeah. So okay, just on just on that Dove question, I, I I simply I know it's an average, and I, I don't have the records, but I'd be just saying to that guy is just make sure you're plus thirty kilograms of fat and protein in the herd. Yeah, I suppose so. To sum up today, uh, is it's talking, it's about looking at the average, uh, in particular for the the team of bulls. Where is your herd? So you need to have your herd plus report to see what your EBI performance is like in terms of the. Of course, you have to have good. Um, you have to have the EBI in the first place. So we come across a good few herds where maybe poor soil recording information, etc. And as a result, we have kind of bad information to work from. So that's a, a starting point for people that might be in that position. But people that have good information on their herds in terms of their EBI report uh, should be trying to select on the basis of what strengths and weaknesses they have there. Obviously, if you have good strengths in fertility and so forth, it allows you maybe uh, a little bit of scope in, so in terms of the range that you use there. Uh, but, but for the most part, most people are going to have to concentrate on milk kilos of solids, as Richie has said there, and target to have that 25 kilos of, a, of an average across the team of bulls that, um, that are going to be used. And then again, just to re-emphasize what Donna said, it's the team of bulls is very important. So yes, there's some fantastic bulls out there, top of the list, and everybody wants to be using what's the best. Uh, but maybe there's been a mis, uh, misguidance in the last number of years. The, top, the Kilfecal Pivotal is the top bull on the EBI list at the moment. He may not actually be suitable for your herd because it may not be the focus of what you're using. Uh, maybe it's the number two bull, maybe it's the number three bull is the best bull on the list for your herd. So it's very important that people take ownership of their breeding situation and have the conversations with either their advisors or their breeding advisors uh, to try and drive that herd forward because uh, exactly as Richie has said there, when you look back at the groups of monitor farmers who have adopted this, it doesn't have to be just the monitor farmers, but just looking at it, having focused on that group of farmers, 
they are beginning to really realize the benefits of that investment in their genetics and the investment in time that is required around the time of AI. And I suppose it's just timely to point out for, that all the AI companies in the current circumstances, if we were in a normal situation, we'd be doing these meetings on a farm probably. So we're doing them here online because of the COVID-19 situation. And the AI companies have worked very hard uh, with the last number of weeks to try and put in place situations that may, will help them to continue their AI service throughout this difficult time. So uh, we spoke about it somewhat yesterday with Jim White as well in terms of how he's going to do it. People need to be organized. And as Richie said, 30% of, of uh, the technician that he was talking to of his clients had uh, sire advice done. We should really be aiming to have that at a higher level in order to make it a, a bit easier for the technicians as well as ourselves, taking away the decisions of what kind of bowl should I be using on a day-to-day -day basis, have it done in advance and get the job out of the way. So um, I think we'll leave it at that. We're just coming to 11 o'clock. Just to remind you that all of our webinars have been recorded and will be available on the Chagas website. The two from Monday and Tuesday are already available. And today's one will also be available probably this evening or tomorrow. And then again, that we're back again tomorrow with uh, Siobhan, Ring um, from ICBF and Noreen McHugh from uh, Chagas to discuss the DBI uh, and calving difficulty stuff as well. So we'd like you to join us again if you can at um, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Apologies for the issues, the broadband in County Waterford seems to be a, a bit of a problem, uh, but sure, look, we can't, we can't do much about it. Uh, and thanks to Richie and thanks to Donna. Donna, I'd say, might, might have a few beads of sweat on his brow in terms of trying to get on the call there at the start. So thanks for putting for together yeah. on Donna and thanks for your time and thank you thank you Richie as well for your time.